Given that the kidney is a very complex system, there's a lot to talk about. So we're going to limit this chapter a little bit to pages 589 through the first paragraph of the, the in the definition of clearance, page 609 in in this in this uh, in this edition of uh, human physiology. That includes these things like kidney functions, basic anatomy. Um, the GFR, that's probably the biggest thing that we're going to deal with today, how, how GFR is created and how we regulate it. That's a big, big section in uh, this lecture uh, that we're dealing with right now. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how the loop of Henle works. It's an osmolarity situation, kind of an interesting one. Again, sort of circling back to some of the early parts of Unit 1. Part two, we're going to deal with reabsorption, renal transport, renal secretion, and excretion and clearance. So we have several major functions of the kidneys, and you should be able to recognize these and see how and, and try to make connections with these functions with what we're going to be talking about in terms of the mechanisms that are going on. Probably one of the biggest ones, now we know about waste removal, we'll get to that in a second, but it's really just part of the, the overall picture. But a big one is regulation of extracellular fluid volume and indirectly blood pressure. By regulating that fluid volume, we regulate blood pressure. Blood pressure is in part due to cardiac output and venous return, which inserts volume into the systemic circulation. So if we start removing fluid with the kidneys, we have less volume in the plasma, which means less pressure. It's a slower mechanism, usually takes a day or two or more to, to, to really manifest itself, but it does uh, have a profound effect in terms of water retention or water excretion. Along those lines, we also can regulate the osmolarity. We can increase or decrease the salinity or the osmolarity of the blood based on what we uh, reabsorb, what we secrete, and, fun and in, in the end, what we excrete. Maintenance of ion balance, again, interrelated with these other two. Ions contribute to osmolarity, so how we balance ions can affect osmolarity, can affect fluid volume and blood pressure. One ion in particular that the kidney can regulate is the proton, so pH. We have respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, and we also have metabolic acidosis and alkalosis, and the kidneys can play a big role in that metabolic side of, of acidosis and alkalosis. Yes, excretion of wastes, we're all intimately familiar with that, particularly the smell of those wastes. They smell like ammonia. That's what gives the nitrogenous waste in urine its smell. If you let urine sit around for a while and you let the, uh, the volatile molecules uh, leave the uh, urine, evaporate out of the urine, it actually just becomes a soapy salt water after time. And I'll let you in on a little trivia. During Roman times, urine was collected as a form of tax. That's because urine, because I, like I said, it becomes a soapy salt water, if you will. It's got these organic acids and it's got urea in it. They would use the urine for laundry detergent. Sounds disgusting, right? Well, welcome to psychosomatic physiology. We tend to, by convention, uh, assume certain things about uh, about uh, body fluids and so forth. Turns out, yes, it is an effective uh, antimicrobial. Uh, urine is, in fact, a biochemical barrier to infection. Uh, it is one of the cleanest. It's, uh, it's probably second only to tears in terms of the cleanliness, in terms of the aseptic characteristics of urine. Now, yes, you can have urinary tract infections and you got bacteria and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's possible. But honestly, from a moment-to-moment -moment basis, the nitrogenous waste, the, the molecules in that uh, urine actually serve as a wonderful biochemical barrier. So like I said, it was a laundry detergent. Didn't mean to wax on too long there, but I think it's interesting. And kidneys are, in fact, an endocrine organ as well. They can and produce uh, hormones that affect uh, water balance, 
um, can affect blood pressure, and those are, are intimately related. Uh, we talked about EPO, erythropoietin, in the blood lecture. Well, the kidneys can sense low oxygen and will uh, start secreting erythropoietin to trigger the bone marrow into making more red blood cells. So the urinary system is comprised of several structures. That includes the kidney as well as the uh, renal artery, uh, the ureter, which is the duct between the kidney and the bladder. And then we have the urethra after that. So there's a lot we could really talk about. I just don't have time. So we're going to focus on, on especially the subcellular functions of the kidney, how we generate the filtrate that then becomes urine later on. Now, the kidney is actually found in a retroperitoneal area of the body. It's retroperitoneal. That is to say, even though it's found in the midsection of the body, it's actually not in the peritoneal cavity. It's actually behind the peritoneum. And it's in a, and it's in a protected spot to the point that if you have uh, kidney failure and you're a uh, candidate for transplant, rather than replace the old kidneys, unless they are, met, you know, uh, potentially carcinogen, you know, malignant or something, if they're just uh, failing kidneys, what they'll do is they'll implant the, the transplanted kidney actually inside the iliac crest to protect it a little bit down here rather than go in and uh, do it in the, uh, the original kidney area. Pretty interesting stuff. And that also has to do with the fact that there's an adrenal gland here and you can cause a lot more problems. Well, there are lots of structures here, and here's the ureter and the, and the junctional area called the renal pelvis. Where we're going to spend our time is in the nephrons, which are located in this outer layer uh, called the cortex. Outer layer, mean, you know, cortex does mean outer layer, so it's the renal cortex. And we also are going to talk about the medulla just a little bit. The medulla is very, very important for water conservation. And in fact, it was the development of the loop of Henle and the medulla that led to what is known as the metanephric kidney. Metanephric kidney was, was essential for animals to learn how to live full time on land. Water conservation is enormous when it comes to land animal survival. And it turns out these medulla areas are osmotic gradients. And so if we look at the loops of Henle in something like, for instance, you have a beaver here and a human and a kangaroo rat, the length of the loop of Henle that you see right here, or there's a shorter one right here in the cortical one, uh, the, length, the average length of the loop of Henle depends on how available water is to that animal. So a beaver is a freshwater rodent, lives a, a, a significant amount of its time swimming in fresh water, doesn't need usually to conserve water all that much. So their loops of Henle on, on average are much shorter than even humans. Humans, you know, in and out of water, we have to find water, and, and water is an important aspect of our lives, though we don't always assume that. Uh, we have sort of a middle of the road one, but we're not swimming in water all the time. And then the kangaroo rat has this as a as a super long one. Uh, and kangaroo rats and other animals like chinchillas and things may live their entire lives without drinking a drop of water. And consequently, the medullas in these kidneys sometimes project all the way out past the pelvis. It's actually quite astonishing. I've been looking for a photo I had a while back that actually you could see the medullas and the capsule projecting out beyond the pelvis. That's because they need a nice long osmotic gradient. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. In human kidneys, we do sort of have two populations of nephrons. Uh, one population of nephron up here in the upper left is called a cortical nephron. And then we have another population that where the glomerulus is right on the edge between the cortex and the medulla. And the loop of Henle projects way, way down into the medulla. That's called a juxtamedullary nephron. Uh, I w I'm not going to discriminate between these two. If you read about the two, my suspicion is, and I have yet to dig deeper into this, is that there are slightly different functions going on that maybe perhaps this one's more involved with certain types of kidney functions uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later 
uh, as well. And this one, the juxtamedullaries are more involved in water conservation. That's just my hypothesis, but we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that for now. But both have the glomerulus. Here's one right here. That's the filtration apparatus. Here it is in the juxtamedullary. Very, very important, a major area of function in the kidneys. Uh, and then we have the, the tubules. Now, normally, this tubular structure that we have here is folded back on itself. So instead of going down like this, the descending loop of Henle, and going to the right, it actually folds back left and goes right in here between these two arterioles that are heading into and out of the uh, glomerulus. But what we're doing here is we're unpacking it so that you can see the full tubular structure of the uh, of the nephron. So we have the Bowman's capsule right here, which houses those fenestrated capillaries known as the glomerulus. Leaving the Bowman's capsule, we have the proximal tubule, and a lot's going on here. In fact, I I abbreviate say a whole you know everything except filtration's going on here, reabsorption, secretion, you name it. Then we have the loop of Henle. We have a descending loop of Henle. Then we have an ascending loop of Henle. Two very different functions, descending and ascending, by the way. We have the distal tubule, and then we have the collecting duct. And these are all, all of these structures have different functions. Even the collecting duct has a little bit of fine tuning in terms of water conservation and so forth going on. So each structure has a, has a different function. You should kind of develop a haiku level function for each of these different structures. And we'll talk about that to help reinforce that, uh, that, uh, that process. If you know nothing else about the medulla, understand that the medulla is the major aspect of the metanephric kidney. It's, it's really, really involved in water concentration. And the loops of Henle, even if you're a cortical nephron or you're a juxtamedullary nephron, do dip into that medulla at one point or another. And the collecting ducts also pass entirely through the medulla. And that medulla contains an osmotic gradient. You are less uh, osmotically uh, strong here and you're exceptionally osmotically strong here. A lot more solute down here than we have up here. And that's part of the major uh, water resorption function of the loops of Henle. And again, the longer they are, the, lo the stronger the osmotic gradient that's generated. We can literally see two molar, two osmolar concentrations or more in very long medullas. And here's a really, really cute uh, kangaroo rat. Like I said, they may drink a dr one, they may never drink a drop of water their entire lives. All of their water is dietary from the plants that they eat. Nephron has a lot of different functions going on, but there are four basic functions, and we can sort of break them out by region. The first function is over here on the left, and that is filtration. So these specialized fenestrated capillaries in the glomerulus undergo that bulk flow process of filtration. They're screening out red blood cells. They're screening out the vast majority of proteins. Only small, relatively hydrophilic molecules can make it through the filtration process. And so we call it filtrate. We don't call it urine, we call it filtrate. That's because we're going to do a lot to it before it actually becomes urine, especially in the concentration realm. Following that, we have the proximal tubule, descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, distal tubule, and collecting duct. There is where you're going to find uh, reabsorption. We're going to reabsorb things that we want to keep, for instance, things like glucose and we amino acids and other things that we want to keep that are water soluble and small and we're going to secrete other wastes so we have a lot of secretion reabsorption going on in these areas mostly in the proximal tubule i want to note let you know though that we only have resorption in the uh, loop of henley and i'll i'll dig into that a little bit later then lastly there's the function known as excretion and excretion really isn't a function per se. Excretion is fundamentally the product of filtration minus what we've resorbed plus what we've secreted. 
So excretion is a passive process, but it is a mathematical process, if you will. So filtration minus the sum of resorption plus the sum of secretion leads to excretion. So here in the glomerulus is where filtration and what we call the GFR occurs. And it's a product of blood flow in, filtration coefficient, um, which lets a certain percent, usually around 20% of the volume out here. The rest of the blood will circulate through the paratubular capillaries and be involved in secretion and reabsorption. All of the tubular structures are re involved in resorption of some kind. A big chunk of it occurs in the proximal tubule. We resorb only water on the descending loop of Henle, and we resorb only sodium and by extension chloride, chloride's along for the ride there, on the ascending loop, and we do some resorption of some other materials in the distal tubule and collecting duct. Secretion, on the other hand, is restricted only to the proximal tubule, distal tubule, and collecting duct. And then lastly, we have excretion at the end. And remember that excretion is the sum of the filtration minus the reabsorption plus the secretion, and generally is about 1% of the renal blood flow that enters the kidney it ends up being excreted. So a very, very low percentage. It's a very, very efficient way of retaining nutrients and fluids in a otherwise dry or mostly dry environment. I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but here's that formula. The, the amount filtered minus what sh that which is reabsorbed into the bloodstream plus whatever is secreted from the bloodstream in this tubular area is what is amount is the amount of solute uh, and material that's that's ultimately excreted and so i've mentioned this before but i'd wanted to show you this from a volumetric perspective if we have volume entering here 20% is filtered and the summation of reabsorption and secretion is equivalent to somewhere around 19%. And that's, that's, that's net reabsorbed. And so our final volume is usually less than 1% of that initial volume in. The implications of this is that it doesn't take a whole lot of change down here in order to significantly change the overall volume since it's already low relative to, to the volume that enters and can be very life-threatening if we have some sort of loss of patency right here and then we're dumping fluid to a much larger degree into the tubule. A quick question here for you to sort of wrap your brain around this. If we're filtering 120 milliliters, so if that 20% is equal to 120 milliliters each minute, what would be the daily renal plasma flow? Why don't you work on that question? That's a great way to figure out how much volume that we have. Uh, to, to not give away the answer, but to tell you a, a quick factoid, fully 20% of cardiac output goes to the kidney at any given time. So when we're talking about systemic blood flow, 20% of that systemic blood flow is going to the kidneys. Pretty impressive, pretty impressive. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to start talking about the function of the glomerulus, which is fundamentally filtration. And look at how fine the structure is. These are known as podocytes. These are specialized cells. They're part of the three-layer system of the glomerulus that makes for a very, very elegant biological filter. Really, really beautiful stuff. And the other side of this is that shows you how hard or impossible it is to replace glomeruli once they've been damaged or destroyed. It's uh, it's very, very difficult because these cells are so specialized, they, they lose their ability to reproduce just like neurons. So if you look at the specific anatomy of the Bowman's capsule, we have several important structures that we need to be able to uh, refer to and talk about moving forward with mechanism. First of all, we have the blood vessels here. We have the afferent arteriole, which is, is, have, which is coming from the renal artery, 
bringing blood into the uh, glomerulus. We have the fenestrated three-layer capillary glomerulus. Then we have the efferent arterial, which takes blood away from the glomerulus and sends it on its way to the proximal tubule, the, the vasa recta, and the, the vascular system that surrounds the tubular systems. So we have the glomerulus, the filtered uh, system. Surrounding the glomerulus is the Bowman's capsule, which is a layer of epithelial tissue. And then there's fluid all through this Bowman's capsule, and that contributes to, to glomerular filtration rate. And then we have the start of the proximal tubule here. One more structure that we need to discuss is this ascending loop of Henle. And I'm not worried about it being thick. But what's happening is the filtrate is coming through here, and a very, very important mechanism is going on in terms of regulating the constriction and dilation of the smooth muscle in the afferent and efferent arterioles, respectively. And I'm going to turn on, if I can, the video camera. So for demonstration purposes, the afferent and efferent arterioles actually constrict and dilate in opposite directions. They have smooth muscle around them, and depending on the signal that's coming from that uh, ascending loop of Henle, they will constrict and dilate in opposite fashion in order to affect the blood pressure that is uh, uh, in, the, in the glomerular uh, apparatus. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture, but I wanted to get that early for you so that you can understand that's a major aspect of regulation. If we zoom in a little bit over here on the right to in, into the glomerulus, what you'll see is that we have these capillaries. And these capillaries aren't normal um, continuous capillaries that we see, say, in the skeletal muscle or the central nervous system or, or other tissues. These uh, capillaries are, in fact, fenestrated. So let's look at a picture here. On the left, we have continuous capillary, and that's the one that's the, that's the most common. And you can see that you have these endothelial cells, and there are junctions here. And there's plenty of leakage, paracellular leakage, between those junctions, unless uh, you, you look at, say, the central nervous system, where they secrete growth factors to make those junctions very, very tight. On the right here, we have the fenestrated, and you can see lots of little pores here, and that allows for lots and lots of bulk flow exchange through from the, um, from the uh, capillary into the space in the Bowman's capsule. So these are fenestrated capillaries. Now, one thing you can't see on here, and I'll illustrate it a little bit more in the next slide, but I'll just go ahead and draw it in right now, is that there's a second layer in between the capillary and then that podocyte. So I'm going to draw a little layer around here. There's a basement membrane there, and it's uh, it's got a roll as well. And then lastly, we have this podocyte, and we're seeing part of it here, but we're seeing these little purple triangles all over the place. Well, those are extensions of that podocyte. So let me show you what I mean. So what you're seeing there is a cross section of these podocytes that are on the outer surface of that glomerular capillary. So it creates a three layer system. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, what is this mesangial cell down here? I'm not really going to get into it. It's sort of a pseudo-contractile cell that helps regulate blood flow. But we're going to stick to the um, afferent and efferent arterioles for this lecture. Yes, these guys do have a role, but it's I don't really want to get into it all that much. So let's get to the next slide. We have the highest magnification, and here is the blood plasma inside the lumen of the capillary. So here, are the, here is the endothelial cell with its fenestrations. Here is that basement membrane that I drew in on the last picture. And that basement membrane, that basal lamina, has a negative charge to it. It's like an electrostatic filter. Most biomolecules are mild organic acids. That's true for amino acids. It's true for nucleic acids. It's true for proteins. They all have a slight negative charge. And the same thing is true with this basal lamina. So it serves as a sort of electrostatic filter, preventing charged molecules from wanting to pass through there. 
And then lastly, here is the here are those podocytes um, that are on top of that basal lamina. Again, making a three-layer system: endothelial cell, basal lamina, and the podocytes. Together, they contribute to what is known. Again, that's fenestrated capillary. Sorry, I forgot about that animation. Glomerular filtration rate. And there are two things that sort of drive GFR. We'll talk about it next time. But I want to kind of place it in your mind that um, the major thing that regulates GFR is actually pressures. Then there is the secondary, which is what we call the coefficient of filtration, which is how porous and how tight this filter is. We're going to focus on the pressures. I will talk about the coefficient of filtration a little bit, but this really does end our presentation today. I wanted to show you this structure and then we'll talk about GFR and how we regulate it um, next time. In summary for this part 1A, we talked about the basic kidney functions. I gave you several basic kidney functions. We focused on the basic anatomy of the kidney, uh, especially with emphasis on the nephron, the glomerulus, proximal tubule, loop of Henle, distal and collecting duct, and, this, and the circulatory structures, vasa recta, etc. Glomerular structure we broke down a little more specifically. So we, at the end of the lecture, we started diving into what's going on right here. The th with the three-layer glomerular membrane, the fenestrated capillaries, and so forth. We did talk a little bit about the osmolarity and the fact that once you get into the medulla, the middle, we have an increasing osmotic gradient um, that occurs, and that's a major aspect of uh, water retention. We absorb water uh, as we get down the loop, and then we absorb actually sodium on the way up. We also do some water collecting during the collecting duct as well. So how osmolarity functions. And so those were the major highlights for today's uh, lecture. And so that's it for today. I will see you next time in part 1B, where we will talk about the regulation and, uh, and uh, modulation of uh, glomerular filtration rate. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.